next panel discussion, which is the final panel discussion at the very first edition of Hash Future, is on the future of banking, finance, and retail. To moderate this session, we have a business journalist of more than 15 years of experience. She was the winner of Fixie Woman of the Year Award. She was also adjudged as Young Global Leader by World Economic Forum. Very proud to present to you Managing Editor of CNBC TV 18, Shireen Bhan. Welcome, ma'am. The first panelist joining her on stage is the Group Managing Director of Hong Kong-based PCCW Limited, an information and communication technology company, Mr. B.G. Srinivas. Next up is the Head of Financial Services Advisory, KPMG India, who has over 30 years of experience in the financial services domain with significant leadership roles, presenting Ms. Gayatri Parthasarathi. Our next panelist isn't a really, really a guest, per se, for Kerala, because she is the Chief Economic Advisor to the Chief Minister of Kerala and was chosen as a young global leader by World Economic Forum, so that's like the second woman, you know, on stage, Ms. Geeta Gopinath, Professor of International Studies and Economics at Harvard University. Two young global leaders are judged by World Economic Forum there. Our next panelist is a man with more than 20 years of experience with leading multinational banks in India and abroad. He's the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Bank, Mr. Sham Srinivasan. <laughs> Up next is a person who's over 26 years of experience spanning country business management and national sales management. This is Mr. Rajesh Rage, who's the Managing Director of Red Hat. And uh, finally, joining the panel, representing the High Power IT Committee, is the Director of Markets and Head of Kochi or Operations for Ernst & Young, Mr. Ajesh Nair. He's more than two decades of experience in advising and managing assignments across organizations. Over to you, Shireen. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here for what promises to be an exciting session. I believe that this is the most balanced panel that we've had uh, in terms of diversity of, uh, uh, of panelists. So we've got, we've got fair representation for, for our sector. So I'm glad that there's women on this panel. Otherwise, it ends up being a manual. So that's a good thing. And, uh, and uh, since this is going to be the last session, I hope that we're going to keep this as provocative as possible uh, and get, get the audience to interact with our panelists here as well. We want to keep this as, uh, as interactive as possible. Uh, please feel free to send us your questions on the Kaizala app and I will uh, post them to our panelists. We're here to talk about the digital future of banking, finance and retail. Uh, exciting areas, areas where India clearly has a competitive advantage and a competitive strength and I would imagine that the government of Kerala is keen uh, that uh, this is going to be an area of opportunity that they would like to focus on as well. But let me get started now and, uh, and talk about the digital future of banking. Mr. Srinivasan and I'm going to start by asking you, sir. There's a lot of controversy around banking. I'll get to that in a moment. But, you know, I, I want to talk to you about a conversation that I had with uh, Uday Kotak, the, the chairman of Kotak Mahindra Bank, and he said there are two things that keep him up at night. One is, uh, you know, what if there were to be a scam or so on and so forth, and the other thing is, what is technology going to do to his business? Does that keep you up at night as well? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, he is lucky. Only two things are keeping him awake. <laughs> uh, I, I have, you can add to the list, sir. Feel yeah, free. I have many more, and one of my board members is here, so I'm very watchful of what I say. Uh, right? But uh, you know, the serious part is uh, certainly uh, sitting here when I'm talking to everybody and making very profound presentations. I don't know in which branch, in which location, somebody may be up to something. Mm -hmm. And even worse, even worse, it's not my employee. Somebody can penetrate and hit the system. So I think the security Is your core banking linked to SWIFT? Uh, I am all, <laughs> all fully connected, don't worry. Uh, but that's also a statement I stay with great uh, care because I don't know what I don't know, like we were discussing a while ago. Yeah. But I think the short point is that 
the two things that uh, you know everybody today is uh, any any threat that is cyber security related threat is one uh, the second and important part is the entire boundaries are completely blurring i mean where mm. banking ends and where technology uh, telecom begins or where one sector ends mm. and the other begins or retail uh, so the core aspect for us as bankers is how do we preserve that trust and make sure that we are like at the center of everything and the platform that we provide is the highway on which many things can drive so i think the short answer is uh, we worry about a lot of things but these two are probably foremost uh, one is security second is uh, the industry characteristics are materially changing and i guess that's an evolution that we have to be sort of mindful and good news is that we have really woken up to it so banks mm. some of us are trying to be right at the forefront that said friends in technology and their companies can do much more so is it how alive how awake are we to that um, so uday is not wrong but i think a few of us have a few other things to worry about too. you know uh, when we were discussing uh, what we were going to chat about here uh, before we came out uh, on stage rajesh brought up an interesting point and let me ask you to comment on that he said how are you going to define i'll i'll get you to comment on that first and then then go across to rajesh how do you define a bank in the next 5 years what is a bank going to look like in the next 5 years you know i often use this line uh, which bill gates wrote 25 years ago in road ahead he said many years later and that's why he's a visionary many years later banking will be important banks will not be important mm. and i think that's very true today uh, if you walk into any branch of any bank right now uh, the crowds are thinning so we are evidently the physical infrastructure doesn't mean much but that banks uh, are often in every conversation the center point suggests that the platform is important and i'm sure quite sure 3 5 10 time horizon i don't know for sure the framework of branches that we all grew up mm. is certainly not going to be what it is but the capabilities that a bank brings the platform that it brings and again banking will have two parts many of us think of banks as only the payments facility yeah there is much more to it than just a payment enabler so i think the banks as we understand today in the payment space is blurring and there's a lot that is happening and it may just become a highway but the aspect of lending the aspect of being a stimulant for corporate growth for industry to benefit from that will be a long while away before it changes so i think there are two aspects to it most of us i think confuse the banks equal to the physicality mm. around it mm. the physicality may change and that it has been changing for last 5 10 regulations are also changing you know rbi for example says that if you are present for 4 hours a day for 5 days a week in any form fixed in a location that is considered a branch mm. we could put a bus fully wired up park it at under a tree in a location mm. for 4 hours a day that would be deemed as a branch mm. so i think the concept of what a branch is changing but that doesn't mean banking will disappear at mm. least for the time i can visualize if you wind back 20 years many people said banks won't exist you know yeah. it's i think yeah. it's yeah this is to a bank today and this is a 79th organ on all of us this is now the organ that we use uh, everything so in many ways this is a branch and it may change it could be in a chip on your lip we don't know banking will exist banks may physically change morph we don't know i i'll talk about the threat that comes from here but that uh, that i'll get to in just a bit geeta if i could uh, uh, you know ask you to comment on what we're going to see in terms of the challenge that this throws up the advent of technology the embracing of technology for the banking sector when it comes to jobs because you know this is this is a crucial area uh, where we are hoping that this is going to be one of the big sectors that will continue to generate employment as we look at you know uh, as we look at this demographic div- then that we want to capitalize on is this going to be a sector that is going to be a big job driver in the future that's a great question um uh, this has come up again every time there's been a technological revolution there's been this question about is technology going to be a net job creator or are we going to end up with uh, job losses uh and i'm just going to echo something that uh, raghuram rajan said earlier which is that or we do know uh from history is that on net it has been a a job creator it's not the exact same jobs but it's different kinds of jobs so for instance in the 1980s when the atm 
ATMs came to the US, were introduced in the US, there was this big concern that there would be this big loss of employment in uh, the banking sector because you didn't need as many tellers to do the same job. Yeah. Uh, but what we saw is on net, you know, 20, 25 years later, is that there was an increase in employment in, uh, in banking. And the reason for that is because with, uh, with the advent of ATMs, it became cheaper to actually uh, run branches. Mm -hmm. And so there was a 50% increase in the number of branches in the US. Uh, and so there was an increase in employment. So while we don't know exactly what the form of technology is going to take and what's going to show up uh, in the future, uh, I do believe that there will be jobs out there that will, have a, will look different from what we have now. Mm. The qualifications that will be required will be different. So for instance, I was just reading that uh, if you want to become a chartered financial analyst, from next year onwards, if you're going to study to take that exam, you're going to actually have to know artificial intelligence, some, some level of that, because that's going to be a part of your test. So the kinds of skills that you need will change over time, uh, but uh, I would expect that there would continue to be jobs uh, available. Mm -hmm. Kathy, would you agree with that, that we are going to see different kinds of jobs being created, but net, this con industry will continue to be a, a job driver? Definitely jobs will be created. I don't uh, see why job loss will be there because uh, it's actually not logical because skill sets may vary, right? The kind of work will vary kind of a thing, but definitely jobs will increase, right? But there is always a myth immediately the reaction is that if we say digital or if we say automation, mm. Am I cutting down on people, right? It is not about, because there is so much more to do, right? If you take a bank, a lot of work the bank has to focus on yeah. is not, you know, is done and in addition to what can be focused by somebody else is also done by the bank. Mm. So you can automate a lot of stuff, right? Mm. And you can do digital a lot of stuff by somebody else, which is not your core business. Okay. So continue to focus on your core, mm. right, which is banking, right, lending. How do you get the trust? Because the industry barriers are completely broken. Mm. I at least see there is no difference today's world in banking and retail. Okay. E-commerce is like completely merged and the moment I take a portal and I'm, you know, sort of integrate the merchants mm. with the bank, retail bank, already I have created an ecosystem or a marketplace, mm. which is combining two different industries, mm. which earlier used to be called financial services banking and or, you know, CP retail, right? Yeah. In, yeah. In that those two industries are merged. Now, the banks used to do focus on in terms of doing everything in the bank, mm. right? Slowly started in terms of intervention of technology, mm. intervention of a lot of automation, etc. So to me, various new things can be done by the same employees, mm. or they have to reskill themselves, or newer skills will be brought in by the people who are doing digital. Mm. That is, will be the, that will be the game. Right? So you, I, I want to get you to comment on the point that Mr. Srinivasan made when he said that, you know, the threat from the mobile phone, uh, and to put it broadly, uh, you know, whether it was wallets, which we saw the advent of, or it's now the possibility of payment banks and whether payment banks will actually be able to capture some of their business and whether these are viable in the long term. What's your own take on that? Because it seems like uh, as far as the wallets are concerned now with UPI, etc., it's a question mark on their viability, on their very existence. But what about payment banks? So wallets was never a bank. Wallets was interim solutions mm -hmm. um, till such time that the country really came up with an integrated solution kind of a thing. Today we have UPI, we have, you know, in terms of uh, every bank has its own mobile app, which is like, you know, as, yeah. to me this is a branch, yeah. literally, right? It's a small branch. You can do almost every transaction from here, right? So every bank has their own mobile app that's available. So given that, wallets have lost their purpose. So any entrepreneurs here who were looking at uh, <laughs> getting into the wallet business, now is not, not, not the great time to do that. But, <laughs> but payment banks? See, payment banks in terms of obviously, in t from a reach perspective, right, payment banks in terms of 
um, maybe this is, may sound controversial, but mm. I'm going to state this. To me, a bank's fundamental business is lending. Yes. If you can't lend, I don't know how you can be called a bank. Mm. So there are remittances business that can happen maybe through payment banks. Mm. They have a whole set of customer base, which is like 200, 300 million customer base, and you can tap into it, and you can be a gateway, but one arm is not there mm. for payment bank. Mm. They can't lend. Mm. So they are not a full-fledged bank. So from that perspective, how, they will, how much of fee-based income really will they earn, and what is the country's sentiment towards fee-based you know, income? How much fee do we really pay yeah. as yeah. Indians? What those will drive in terms of the success or failures of the payment banks. But truly, they are not full-fledged banks. Not full-fledged. I'll get you to comment on that before I go to uh, BG. Uh, do, are you at all worried about the threat that payment banks, for instance, throw up? Don't like That's not what keeps you up at night. Yeah, I don't like to be disrespectful <laughs> to competitors. That answers it, right? So, yeah, okay. Po polite, polite way of polite way of responding. All right, BG. Let me let me uh, you know take forward the point that we just had there from Guy Three on on the blurring of lines between banking, commerce, retail. Uh, you know, what's what does the future look like uh, from where you see it today? See, I think, uh, as, as Gayatri mentioned, there is definitely blurring of lines, and particularly between retail and, and uh, uh, banking itself. If you look at what has happened to the retail industry per se, again, in terms of what was mentioned, banking versus banks, significant disruption has happened to the retail industry. If you see the recent news, Toys R Us in the U.S. Yeah. shutting shop, yeah. 700 stores, and... The, what struck me in this uh, was not just one other retailer going mm. down. The fact that Toys R Us going to the shop was an experience. It was yeah. a fun experience. Yeah. Going to a bank is not a fun experience. <laughs> so if people have stopped going to Toys R Us to even forego the fun experience, there's no way the banks would, would survive in its current form. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, again, drawing parallels, if you look at the number of retailers in the US with a shut shop, physical 7,000 outlets in one year. Mm. 1,700 banks in the US branches have shut shop. So this is for real. The, the disruption is for real. Yeah. The form in which this is transforming and morphing into was what was mentioned was smartphones taking over yeah. most of the interactions. The, the adaptive lifestyle of mm. the individual consumer mm. is actually making every sector transform. Mm. And retail and banking, definitely. The retail banking, definitely, yes. Mm. Because the consumer is now in charge, mm. armed with the most powerful smartphones, yeah. armed with real-time connectivity, yeah. and more importantly, armed with platforms which have not been actually promoted by the banks mm. or by the retailers. Mm. It's been promoted by new startups. It could be a messaging platform, it could be a video platform. Mm. The disruption is coming through a completely different, different. Field, left yeah. field. And that has actually accelerated the transformation mm. of both the retail industry and the banking industry. Mm. And we have seen that happen in every aspect. The consumer is interacting more and more through smart devices, consuming more, we, in, in our business, which is video streaming business, we see average consumption in the Southeast Asian region is two to two and a half hours per day mm. of video consumption happening on smart devices. So interaction has gone up, consumption has gone up, transactions have gone up. With this kind of a convenience, it's, it's hard to say that disruption is not happening. Mm. Number two, again, in Toys R Us example, another thing which struck me was not only the fact that you have stopped going to store to buy anything. It is because you have options of Amazon and yeah, other e-commerce. Yeah. The fact that even the fun part has gone digital. Physical toys are being replaced by digital ecosystems. So the digital disruption is definitely impacting all aspects of every sector. And if you take banking industry per se, if you take the value chain, mm. customer experience, personalization, customization, yeah. Yeah. fraud management, yeah. 
every aspect of the, the value chain is being impacted by technology. And those are the areas of opportunity that the young entrepreneurs here should, should focus on. So that, that is the space, uh, you guys, that, that you should be looking out for. Uh, but, but a very quick question before I get to the, the two Rajeshs that we have on the panel. Uh, uh, you know, you, you talked about how the experience no longer matters and uh, the convenience of e-commerce, you're seeing transactions go up and so on and so forth. But what about viability of e-commerce platforms themselves? I mean, there is a question mark today in India whether we are going to see consolidation. They continue to burn significant amount of cash. What is going to, what is the need of the hour in terms of changing the e-commerce model as we see it today, specifically from an India perspective? See, so I think the e-commerce perspective, which, which the challenges of e-commerce platforms in India is not unique. Globally, if you look at any kind of e-commerce digital platform, initially it was all about growth, capturing market share, yeah. and, and consolidation. Even Amazon took many, many years yeah. to even turn profitable. So today, I think the challenge in India is there are two, two to three players all scrambling for mad rush for growth. It has to, like any mature industry, stabilize, and then people should stop giving significant subsidies to consumer. Consumer obviously is benefiting. So that has, one is you attain scale, you drive economies of scale, fine, but after mm. that, you just focus on customer experience and convenience rather than just giving discounts. And then, then today, most of them you know, are chasing value. I, 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 I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I, this takes me back to a conversation that I had with Kishore Biani, and his argument to me was, once they stop subsidizing, Let's talk, let's talk then. Let's talk about transaction volumes then. Let, let them stop subsidizing and then we'll talk about uh, the, you know, the boys versus the men. I agree with that because if you look at any business which cannot turn to profit, if not now, next five years, even if that on the financial model, then it's not a sustainable model. Either it, it will get sold out, it will consolidate, or the last man holding the yeah. shares will take the hit. Okay. Rajesh, let me come to you now. What, what is exciting you about the three spaces that we're, that we're talking about and the way that they're being disrupted by technology? Which are the aspects of opportunity that you're particularly focused on? Uh, to say it, disruption is happening is an understatement. It is all, all around us. Uh, the important aspect to consider is software essentially is disrupting industry after industry. We have seen that happen in the transportation space. Uber, for example, is the world's largest transportation company, doesn't own any asset, has $70 billion in, you know, in market cap, mm -hmm. and is the most visible name in the transportation space. Similarly, if you look at hospitality, Airbnb came out of nowhere and has become the preferred hospitality uh, company yeah. with billion dollars worth of valuation and revenues, right? So industry after industry has sort of got disrupted by new software coming in. And I think that is similar uh, story is on the cards, whether it is banking, financial services, or, uh, or retail, mm. or what have you. The question is, at what pace and how soon? Mm. Right? Now, over the last five years or so, we've seen uh, new facilities, new f features, functionality being offered by conventional banks. But at the same time, payment banks, uh, uh, wallets, et cetera, mm. coming in. And all of that is based on a platform of technology, which mm. is the one that is really of interest to me, right? All of these industries are leveraging a strong bedrock of technology to come up with a better feature functionality, better customer experience, and at the same time to gain that competitive advantage, mm. to gain market share and what have you. Now, where we stand today, it is very obvious that the face of banking or the face of financial services as we see today is not what is going to be in maybe six months time. Mm. A conventional bank, if you were to look at it, had three constituent elements to it. It had customer relationships, it had some element of technology, and it had the most important part, which was trust, right? The relationships will remain. Technology will drive how you engage with your customers, how well you understand them, how well you are able to profile them, what you can sell, sell to them, whether it is day or night, whether it is in person, or whether it is yeah. across different channels. The trust aspect, as we have seen in India, mm. you know, has been front page news uh, <laughs> over the last several you know, weeks. And it is something that, in some cases, is earned and retained significantly, and in some cases, is getting disrupted or lost very, very rapidly. Yeah. And we shall not discuss what those stories are. Right? Now, in that context, 
I think technology has an important role to play and I think the future mm. is going to be determined by people who invest significantly in technology to solve some of these challenges and some of the opportunities are in front of us. Mm. The opportunities from an India perspective, whether if you look at banking or retail, are incredible. We are talking about tens of millions or even hundreds of millions mm. of consumers, mm. right? And on, in that light, I would like to add a couple of points from a technology perspective. Yeah. The first is if you need to address the needs of a marketplace as, as large and as diverse as India is, two or three things need to happen. The technology needs to be built to scale. Mm. Because today you may have you know, a few thousand customers on a Diwali day or on a, on a special yeah. day, yeah. it may reach up to a million. Right. You need to have the ability to manage it. The second is when disruption happens, and it will happen, it's a question of just when, you need to be able to pivot, you need to be able to change direction mm. very, very quickly. So mm. you need to have agility and speed built into the entire thing. So I think people who are able to build agility into their design, into mm. their thinking, people who are able to you know, build for scale are the companies that eventually will leverage technology, yeah. gain market share, and of course, you know, be the poster child of the new India or the new consumer you know, uh, mm. space as it evolves tomorrow. Okay. So those uh, are the few comments that I would like to make. Yeah, before I come to Mr. Srinivas, and I do want to point out that you know a lot of a lot of the bankers are getting a bad rap uh, over the past few weeks. But as the SBI chairman told me uh, last week, that look, uh, you know, uh, when you walk into an airport, leave a thank you note for the banker because not not everything that the bankers have done they've done wrong. So we we don't we don't mean to diss you all the time, Mr. Srinivasan, uh, or or bankers. But let let me ask you since since uh, uh, since we talked about the the possibility of the Uberization or the Airbnbization for for banking, from a regulatory perspective, you know what will be the challenges? Because, uh, for instance, today we're seeing this battle play out between uh, Paytm and WhatsApp Pay over you know whether WhatsApp is getting more concessions in the manner in which they can uh, offer their services, and Paytm says that that's not a level playing field, and so on and so forth. So when we talk about these big technology-driven disruptions, is the regulatory architecture, the regulatory changes keeping pace, and what do we need to sort of address on that front? I think the, uh, again, I go back to this whole uh, conversation is, uh, when we say banking, we actually, it's a proxy for payments as a, as, yeah. as a platform, right? In that space, a, a lot of evolution is happening, and that is the place that is getting maximum disruption. Mm. Uh, I, I think the regulators themselves are also discovering as it's, uh, as it's going. Because I don't think it's a, a templated space that yeah. somebody had a greater knowledge than the other. And it's evolving. Uh, 18 months back, NPCI was not as formidable as it is today mm. with UPI. And uh, even today, if you see UPI's evolution, it's been more in a person to person. When it becomes person to merchant, and which I think is the crying need of the R and which in six, 10 uh, year, year out will be a more material part. I'm uh, sure that we're going to discover many more leakages that needs to be plugged. Mm. So I think the regulatory system is evolving. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, you know, the certain degree of uh, diversion because of the other issues banks are facing is compelling regulators to put this on the back burner because mm. there are other compelling issues that are, they are dealing with. So all regulation is may, may be getting directed to those areas. But in a, it's only a matter of time before uh, the, the both enabling and restrictive regulations are going to happen around this because it's like somebody pointed it's a force that cannot stop it's okay, now yeah, real yeah you can't pretend like this will go away yeah it's only how do you enable it and put the protective cover around it but absolutely this is now whether you know toys are us or whatever equivalent Banks are still fun to go to. Huh? We are not that bad people. Uh, but I think what, what is the most fun thing we can do if we walk into your bank? You come to my <laughs> stall here, and I'll show you the kind of. You no, know, I, I, I don't know if I'm taking it away from this. Uh, we are not all that boring. There's a lot of good stuff that happens in a bank, and uh, today, 95 percent or 99 percent of people sleep easy because we are taking good care of the money. There are these odd errant activities, but by itself. We do a lot of stuff that keeps you all happy. And just that you can do other things is a good way to be. So you're fun and you're safe. Yes, you okay. are. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> let, let, let me. 
Uh, let me get uh, Rajesh in. Uh, you know, Rajesh, just to pick up a point uh, from from where Mr. Sridivas had left, that you know, this is this is this is not going to stop here, and it's an idea that has uh, uh, you know truly arrived. Uh, if I were just to take a look at the numbers, digital transactions crossed the billion mark in December, up six percent over November. Transactions on UPI also at a new record high of 145.5 million. That's the number that we saw in December. But in terms of the protective cover or the protective shield that Mr. Srinivasan spoke of, as we see these numbers move higher, what is it that we need to focus on? So I think some of these uh, security and protection issues will be, uh, will be core to what, uh, what even consultants do uh, in, in the next uh, six, to, uh, six months to a year's time. Uh, a point of caution also is, I think the way we look at this entire uh, word called trust mm. is, uh, is being debated uh, you know, endlessly. And uh, cyber security, financial security, all these, uh, I, don't have, I don't have solutions today, but these are, these are some of those questions which we will have to ponder time and again. Every so when people say blockchain is the solution, blockchain is what we should be focusing on and so on and so forth. I mean, even the, bu the budget this year, uh, the finance minister spoke about how blockchain will be the thing that the government will focus on. How do you respond to that? So I, I, th I think it's an interesting idea, but some of these things are, uh, it's in a very early stage of implementation. And I'm sure it will take a little more time uh, for us to sit on the drawing board and figure some of these things out. I think the, the point of interest and something slightly different from the others is, uh, we also need to look at the changing skill profile of this entire uh, mm. industry. Today, a traditional banker is, is not a financial service professional. He is perhaps even as good as uh, he, he as good with technology as an IT professional. Mm. So you have you need a lot more people with combinatorial innovation skills. Yeah, that was the point that Gita was making. Yeah. 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 So those are the kind of kind of guys who are going to come in because we don't have all the answers today. So mm. while we say that blockchain seems promising, there are some examples of where blockchain has brought in very interesting innovations mm. across, but it's still early days to say that you know that's the answer. So we need we need professionals who will look at these multiple innovation avenues and figure out you know what's the best way to do it. Mm. Uh, Biji, uh, you know, I want to come to you now, and, and since we're talking about the future and we're talking about opportunities for India to be able to leverage on, what should we be, sh what should we be, be focusing on from a skilling perspective, for instance? I mean, we've got this young population that's coming into the workforce. Uh, you talk to companies, they say not everybody is employable. Uh, you know, so, so where, do we, where do we focus on as we talk about the future of these three uh, big areas? Now, just before I respond to this, just uh, want to suggest something on the fun part of going to a bank. Uh, you're also referring to the Airbnb concept, the shared economy yeah, concept. Yeah. In my view, even today, uh, while the, whether it's Uberization of, of uh, the taxis or, or residences becoming Airbnbs, why should it still be a linear way of looking at these mm. assets? Mm. For example, today if you look at the youth, most of them go to coffee shops and they spend their time in coffee shops. Why can't coffee shop be the place where a banking transaction or advisory roles can happen with an iPad? Mm. That is Uberization across. <laughs> and, and we have to also look at the, when we're looking at the future 10 years, 15 years from now, you, we are not the people who are going to carry out those transactions. Mm. It will be the next generation. And where are they spending their time? Mm. I'm sure they're spending more time in coffee shops than any other place. <laughs> But, of, of course, apart from their jobs and all of that, what I'm trying to say is this Uberization can cut across boundaries. You can definitely today, be, when you're talking of cashless transaction, mm. you don't need a bank with an old and, mm. and mm. security, all of that. Yeah. You can carry out consulting advisory services sitting in a coffee shop. Yeah. And, and that is something definitely possible. And again, switching back to your primary question of, of the skilling challenges and... and if you look at draw parallels to the IT sector, mm. which, which actually paved the way for the explosive growth of the sector itself, India never produced that many computer science graduates. Even today, it does not. But the only way that IT industry scaled up was by investing significantly into training, training and yeah. certification. Yeah. And an making it an ongoing process of training and mm. certification mm. to scale up all other disciplines of engineers to mm. become software engineers. Similarly, if you look at the banking industry on the process side can draw parallels from the BPO industry. Mm. How today, 
a BPO employee sitting in any part of India, or for that matter, any part of the world, can actually handle a transaction for an American Express Bank or, or a Bank of America, tra carrying out transactions which are happening in any other part of the world. Mm. And this happens simply by ensuring that the workflow definition is rule-based and, and there's enough checks and balances, and then training him or her. Mm. And, and that is something, as we go through the transformative changes of what the bank branches, what transactions happen mm. in the bank branches, to upskill and also de-skill some yeah. of the, that is definitely a learning. And, and that is something I think, particularly state of Kerala, where there's so much rich in talent and, and more particularly the educated class can yeah. do a lot more in trying to create a hub for these kind of talent. Okay, okay. Gati, you know, I wanna- uh, Shireen, I, I had a quick comment yes, to what uh, BG was saying. The coffee shop model of banking already exists. I have had people jumping at me in airports selling credit cards or offering loans at petrol yeah. pumps. Yeah. So some aspect of it is already underway. Yeah. The question is the broad-based part is still not there. Yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> and just to take that point forward, yeah. Gayatri, uh, you know, uh, we were talking about payments and the future of payments, but also the opportunity that exists in niches, for instance. I mean, PayPal uh, said that, you know, now in the US, it's being used by my, you know, my parents' generation, or your grandparents' generation, so how do you go after the youth? So they started a specific service which involves social media plus payments to go after the youth. How important is it going to be for companies, for entrepreneurs to focus on niches? Uh, and, and is that where the profit and the new opportunity will lie? On the payment side, you're asking? Yeah, on the payment side, yeah. Okay, so we are actually, as Shyam said, we're restricting banking to payments, <laughs> looks like that. <laughs> We've forgotten a big portion of the banking, but definitely, uh, I'll tell you in terms of, uh, um, if you look at in terms of niche or a segment, or maybe segment is a wrong word nowadays, I would call it as in terms of lifestyle of people, right? In terms of where you need to go. Definitely you need to, I think yesterday morning session it was when, uh, Chris was, I think, uh, you know, addressing on the data part of it, right? Data plays a huge role, mm -hmm. and truly data has become, I would say, more than natural resource, mm. right? Yes. It's become more than, you know, to me, I think, um, in banking world, it's more important than water, almost. It could, it could make it, many it, billion it, dollars for you, it could uh, shave off several billion dollars billion of dollars market cap, uh, market as, as cap Mark Zuckerberg whatever, now right? knows. So data yes. is becoming more important than water in the banking world, to be very honest. Okay. So if you really look at in terms of data, then you really need to look at in terms of just not what is so standard about me, mm. but in, in terms of the banking or the transactions that I do, mm. but what is my lifestyle, right? Capture lifestyle, and that is where customer segmentation will move from customer lifestyle, mm. and that is when you will capture whether it is coffee shop banking, yeah. or whether it is campaign-based banking, or it is truly personalized banking mm. that needs to be done, mm. or to a segment that it needs to be you mm. know, taken care. Coming to coffee shop banking also, I'll give you an example. I don't know how many have uh, seen the Berlin branch of Deutsche Bank. It's the most, I would say, most beautiful, fun place to go to. <laughs> There is a coffee shop, there is an advisor who will let you know on investment advisor, and there is also a person who will look at in terms of your regular transactions that can be done, mm. and there is a childcare area so parents can leave the children mm. there, and then they can do serious banking transactions. So it is all in one, maybe beautiful branch that was set up, right? So bank, banking can also be fun with respect to having coffee, not having to take care of your children, and you do really your investment planning. Can, can you and throw whatnot. in a massage as well, sir, while, while, you're, <laughs> while you're at it, since we're, since we're sending in our suggestions to you anyway. I just, I just want to jump in. I'm not a fan of this coffee shop banking idea. I think it's going to kill the fun of coffee shops. So <laughs> it's already done, right? Okay, you don't have to go to Berlin. When you're flying out today, please stop at our experience center, which is only one kilometer, 100 meters away from the airport. <laughs> I f invite everybody in this panel and the audience, if you see a better place, I'm ready to leave my job. <laughs> and there is oh, no better place. <laughs> I assure you, 
short of a massage, everything is there. Right? And uh, coffee in the real sense. <laughs> right? But okay. uh, that notwithstanding, please visit our stall. You'll see everything that you ask. Absolutely. All right, sir. We, we, we shall do that. But Geeta, I want to move to, to talk about something that we spent a lot of time talking about uh, post-November 2016 when we saw demonetization, which was the future of cash. We're talking about the future of banking, retail, and finance. But what about the future of cash? Because what we've seen is that post-demonetization, cash levels are back to pre-demonetization levels. Uh, so, you know, do you, do you really think that India is going to be a significantly, we are a less cash economy uh, if we hadn't seen demonetization, even though cash levels are back to pre-demonetization levels, but do you see us being a significantly less cash economy as we go forward? Uh, so, so, a couple of things that need to be understood. So, uh, so you're right that we're back to uh, the same levels of cash as at the time of demonetization, but we're below trend. And so there has been some switch away from cash to other uh, forms of financial assets. Uh, the idea of, you know, sh do all countries ultimately head towards a cashless economy? I mean, if you were to guess which is the country that has the highest amount of cash per capita, does anybody have any idea who that, which country that is? No, no, it's not the US, it's Japan. Yeah. Japan has the highest amount of cash to, uh, per capita way more than India. So it's not as if countries eventually uh, head towards a, a cashless limit. Um, it serves a purpose. Cash does serve a purpose in this country. It's still very much the instrument for transaction mm. in many parts of the country. Uh, and so it serves a purpose. Uh, and as long as that's a, that purpose, there's not an easy substitute for it. What you're certainly seeing, you know, payment technologies come in that do substitute for it. In the absence of that, that's not going to disappear. Uh, another thing I want to flag, which is quite related, is that, you know, besides cash, there's, of course, this excitement of other kinds of financial instruments that mm. work like cash. Mm. Bitcoin. Yeah. That was a, that was yeah. a big phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, and that's something worth flagging, which is, uh, you know, with all this talk of uh, uh, digital technologies and everything that can be done, and I'm learning for the first time that banking is a whole lot of fun, apparently. <laughs> uh, you know, pe people can confuse an actual service uh, to what looks like what is basically something does not provide a service, has no fun fundamental content, and is entirely a bubble. And this happens uh, every time there's a technological revolution, there's a disconnect between the stock market and the real economy. Mm. So in the financial space too, I think it's quite important to keep in mind, and especially for, for consumers to keep in mind, you know, the difference between what's real technology, what's real improvement, and what's just, uh, you know, hyped up, uh, piece of uh, instrument. I, I haven't heard a single a... banker uh, say anything nice about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency in general. Uh, from uh, Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan to Ajay Banga at Mastercard, I don't know what your views are on it, sir, but everyone has basically said that it's, it's a fraud waiting to be unraveled. What's your own take on whether that is in fact the case? Uh, I, it's, again, the technology, the blockchain technology that goes into such kinds of cryptocurrencies has value. I don't think we fully unearthed the true value of it, like Rajay said, we, we will have to wait and see what the applications are. But the whole idea that we're going to replace uh, a unit of account mm. that is backed, like for instance, the Indian rupee that's backed by the Reserve Bank of India with this decentralized currency is in my opinion is dead on arrival. Mm. Okay, you think it's dead on arrival, but uh, Rajesh, let me ask you this because we have a committee in India that's looking at how do you regulate cryptocurrency. They don't actually call it cryptocurrency because the government doesn't consider it currency. They call it crypto assets. Uh, it's not legal tender, but whether it will be legal or not is what is up for debate at this point in time. What is the future that you see for cryptocurrencies, for digital currencies? I mean, governments in Sweden, for instance, are looking at the possibility of, of a digital currency as well. See, personally, um, I tend to agree with Geeta in terms of uh, uh, the point that currency backed by an RBI kind of, it, it looks like a completely robust model. Mm -hmm. We don't want to write off the entire uh, cryptocurrency slash Bitcoin, uh, you know, the entire, because a lot of people are adopting it and seeing value. Mm. The, the underlying technology has value, definitely. Uh, blockchain, we have seen not just in finance, but we have seen it in other industries having value. Mm. Uh, I think it's still initial days, and uh, this committee is not going to come and uh, make recommendations in the ne near future. Mm. They'll take their while to figure out uh, how this is going to pan out. Mm. And uh, as of now, 
it, it's you know it's anybody's guess how this is going to pan out. Guy three, you have a smile on your face. What, what does that mean? <laughs> I just want to consider it as is it just an asset class? Uh. And if it is just an asset class and a different asset class, it may be called today as not a legal tender, mm. but is it like, you know, almost for me in, uh, if I have to draw, uh, you know, an analogy, it's been in shape. We mm. call, stop calling it from cryptocurrency, but mm. it's a crypto asset. Asset, right? yeah. And it is a different asset class, mm. like any other asset class. Mm. And that, that flight has taken off. Yes. Somebody has to really land it safe. Yeah. Right. Mm. So there is no question of us saying it is not existing or exactly, it is exactly. That is what I wanted to, you know, yeah. sort of say. But yeah. definitely underlying technology and the platform mm. or the fabric, right, is fundamentally needed. Mm. Like like blockchain, the mm. fabric is needed, and that will yield multiple use cases in this country to work very well. Mm. Not That's only in banking, but in various other, you know, industries as well, yeah. right? And that is what I, I, I personally feel that it is an asset class, mm. and it leave it as an asset class and don't worry about it too much. Mm. And it's already taken to some level. So as I said, somebody has to just do safe landing of that and not crash it. Uh, uh, absolutely. And you know, you can't have the government or the regulators say that, look, uh, do this at your own peril or at your own risk. Uh, yes, BG, you wanted to make a point on, on, on that. Yeah. So I think uh, while I'm, I'm coming from outside the sector uh, and looking at cryptocurrency, if you purely look at it from an advantage perspective, from a user perspective, mm. I think it's, it's undeniable that kind of advantages and, and whether you want to transact uh, across borders or, or use one form of currency. I think today there's like any other disruption, mm. the incumbent will always be resisting mm. the change. Okay. Maybe it starts with denial and then resisting the change. But as, as Gayatri mentioned, if through the regulator there is a safe landing provided, there are enablers like yeah. blockchain comes into, there's yeah. no reason if there is a compelling value proposition to the consumer, there's yes. no reason why one should stop it. For example, this happened in the telco industry, right? Mm. Messaging was a big thing for telcos as an income. Yeah. The disruptors were not from within the ecosystem. It came from outside. WhatsApp, yeah. And WhatsApp, WeChat. It's yeah. such an incredible, powerful platform. These yeah. two alone, today, one third of the global mm. population is on just these two platforms. Yeah. So there has to be room for disruption. And as long as it's a compelling uh, proposition for the users, yeah. one should not stop it. Uh, you know, I, I, there's somebody who sent us this question. Uh, let me put that to you, BG. How will it affect the bank if e-commerce companies like Amazon introduce their own cryptocurrency for purchase and transaction? Why not? It, it, why not? I mean, absolutely. I mean, today, if you go back to the fundamentals of exchanging goods, even before currencies came into picture, it was all trading, right? Mm. So you can have any form of trading. And today in the digital world, cryptocurrency is just one other asset class of trading. So there's no reason why it should not. And, and they are the ones who stand to benefit as well. So mm. they are an interested party and they have the money power to do it, unlike startups, which you find it difficult. Mm. Okay, uh, Mr. Srinivasan, more questions that have come in. Uh, uh, there's somebody here who wants to know your thoughts on risk funding in the, the current context. And uh, I think that echoes a general sentiment and general concern. Are we likely to see a credit freeze or do you believe that your risk appetite is still intact in terms of lending? Uh, I can say for us as, as a bank, uh, we are now in a position to say no to some credits uh, versus saying yes to everything. Right? Okay. I think there is... Uh, and there is a fundamental shift, unfortunately, because some of the banks that have been impacted more recently because of the credit events, maybe there is a, a certain degree of nervousness among some sector of the banks. Mm -hmm. So banks like us or some of the private sector banks are actually in a position to uh, go out and write more business. So I okay. don't think it's a generic freeze. That said, certain institutions or certain banks are sort of readjusting to a new reality and are probably struck by uh, some events that have uh, probably not visualized, mm. and that's causing them to put a freeze. But so I can't say that it's an industry-wide phenomenon. Yes, that they occupy 70% of the banking space, uh, but that also means it presents opportunities for banks like us to keep growing. Okay. Uh, so I wouldn't categorize this as a 
a freeze or a panic situation as much as certain categories of banks are currently sort of uh, readjusting and uh, recouping some of their uh, breath to come back uh, with full force. But that presents an opportunity for us. And risk funding, uh, for a good project, I've always maintained there's money that is available. Mm -hmm. I have never uh, believed that, uh, yeah, if uh, the idea is flaky and you want money, sorry. <laughs> But if for all good ideas, there are enough banks and enough institutions ready to put money. And we can see live institutions which we have funded or many have funded which have okay. uh, the ideas more rich. Okay. Let me put the question that we've got uh, to both the Rajeshes and maybe you want to take a stab at it first. Uh, uh, will we see cloud technologies being embraced by the banking sector in the near future or is it likely to continue to be on-premise mostly? Cloud is a, is a reality that is here to stay. Right. I mentioned earlier on that one of the important aspects that we need to consider is scale. And cloud as a technology offers you the opportunity of potentially unlimited scale. So when you're talking about on-prem, you are, you are limited by what you can put in a data center, how many servers you can buy, and how much is the utilization of those servers and all the other mm. infrastructure on an ongoing basis. Uh, cloud is a simpler way out wherein you can just rent capacity on demand. Uh, so cloud definitely is something that will get very tightly integrated. Now there are a few areas that need to be worked through. The first of course was data sovereignty. A lot of large mm. cloud players are not local. Uh, they used to be global companies, but they have now set up local data centers. So they have worked around the issue of having Indian customer data being resident inside the shores of India. Uh, the second aspect is uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the availability of uh, uh, skill sets mm. uh, that typically a bank would have uh, and the ability to span what is available on-prem versus what is available on, on the cloud, right? So if I take a view going forward, both will coexist. You know, some stuff depending on peak, depending on if there is a Dasara or a Black Monday or whatever, yeah. you will use more capacity on the cloud. Uh, important, critical, differentiating applications will be kept in-house. They will be closely guarded okay. secrets. Okay. And the rest of it perhaps will go on to the cloud. So a coexisting model is something definitely on okay. the cards. A, a coexisting model is something that you see. Geeta, there's a question that's come in for you. Uh, does a Kerala bank, as proposed by the Kerala government, sound like a good idea when public sector banks have not really shown that they are accountable? I think as a policy, I try not to talk speak publicly about these kinds of questions. So OK, you're going to you're going to pass to that. Okay, so, so but do you think that public sector banking and the fact that India continues to have the largest share of public sector banks anywhere in the world, do you think that this is now the time and the opportunity for us to reimagine public sector banking in India? No, I mean, there's certainly absolutely a, a, a big concern that's arisen with 70 percent of banking services going through the public sector in, in India and the extent of non-performing loans and the fraud that has been, uh, been, uh, been seen, there, there's certainly, uh, you know, one needs to get mm. to the bottom of these issues. Uh, they need to respond more to market forces. They need to have more market discipline. I mean, but that said, you know, I'm, I live in a country that just went through one of the biggest uh, financial crises, and it was entirely private sector banking. Yeah, uh, And so it's not as if just switching to the private sector solves all those problems. We've seen both true. sides of it, and there's regulatory needs on both sides. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, Gati, there's a question that's uh, come in. Uh, let me toss that across to you. Will crowdfunding change the way that we look at lending, uh, and, and how significant is that likely to be? See, crowdfunding can definitely changing the lending from, you know, the traditional way to the new way of this thing. But in terms of, yes, it does happen even today in my mind in certain states, certain industries, right? Take maybe, you know, in terms of Gujarat real estate, mm. it's crowdfunding only. If there is a land that is there and it has to be 10 apartments have to be, you know, sort of constructed, the money is never taken as a mm. loan. It is crowdfunding. Mm. Okay, so it is, it is today even also practiced in certain areas, certain uh, you know places, uh, you know pretty well. But will that become absolutely an alternate channel for banking in terms of doing lending? The answer is no, mm. because you need to have, you know, much more in terms of your collaterals, your you know your uh, credit case and everything, and right. you need to look at that, and uh, that is fundamental 
you know, principle of what a banking operation is supposed to do. Sure. So crowdfunding can happen. Crowdfunding is happening today, right? And uh, it is working in smaller circles, but that cannot replace the complete, you know, economy yeah. of what a bank should do from a lending perspective. You know, there's a lot of questions here that have come in around security. BG, let me start by asking you. Uh, you know, we, we talked, or didn't talk about it, but we know what's happening as far as the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data breach is concerned. There are similar concerns uh, being raised here in India with respect to the Aadhaar. Uh, the hearings are currently underway in the Supreme Court. As we move towards this digital future, how imperative is it going to be to have a robust data protection, data privacy legislation in the country? No, in fact, uh, there won't be anything more important than that. In fact, Today, if you look at most large enterprises, not necessarily to the, with the financial service industry, most large enterprises' top risk item, which discuss, gets discussed at the board level, is cybersecurity. Under that umbrella, you also have data protection, all of that. So this will have to be addressed, both policy making, uh, assurance, trust. If the digital ecosystem has to survive and uh, has to, definitely be sustainable, that has to be addressed. Apart from the policy, again, technology problems can be solved. Mm. There's enough technologies which can make sure there's safety, uh, there's enough, and, and it will continue. There will always be some breaches and then there will be fixes, and that, I'm sure, can be addressed. But underlying pro uh, policy making and providing a trust mm. to ensure that people can assume it is as safe as if they are holding cash. Mm can be done, and it, it, it's not impossible, it should be done. And I think also the fact that if there's so much of concentration of data sitting yeah. with the government, again, how does the government go about assuring that this data will not be misused? Mm. And then there has to be ample actions taken, not just words, because people don't simply trust the current system. Yeah, uh, Geeta, you wanna come in on that, on, on the need for a robust uh, data privacy, data protection legislation? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, that's probably going to be one of the foundation stones for t leveraging all this new new technology, you know, machine learning and everything. If we if we can't protect the data and if we can't protect the privacy of individuals, uh, you know, this it would not it would simply not um, take. But off. do you see more regulation coming in? Because that's the threat now in the U.S. Uh, we had Cheryl Sandberg on CNBC saying, "Okay, we're prepared for more regulation." The question is, what kind of regulation? Do you see that we are now going to see much more regulation? I expect so. Yes, I think that there will be, uh, especially when you have an event like what happened with Facebook. Uh, I think that absolutely that there will be a more, more regulation in this sector. Yeah, Rajesh. See, on that, on that subject, technology is moving very, very rapidly, right? Legislation will typically, you know, trail the technology. So one will need to sort of go through a few ups and downs to mm. see how technology gets implemented, uh, perhaps learn from some of the pitfalls that you will encounter, and then, of course, have the necessary legislations passed to safeguard the new technology and the interest of the consumers. Mm -hmm. So it's a lag and lead kind of a environment yeah. because uh, most legislatures will be significantly behind in understanding the impact of technology mm -hmm. and what uh, change it is driving. Okay, yes, BG. Uh, just, uh, just to again uh, touch upon that, as you rightly said, yes, technology's uh, pace of uh, growth is far ahead. And mm -hmm. then two examples, if I can draw, what's happening in Hong Kong versus what's happening in mainland China is a glaring example. The kind of innovation and disruptive innovation happening in China is far ahead of Hong Kong, mm. particularly in the financial service industry as well. Because, as, as well because as you tech. believe regulation is holding because back. Because the regulatory body is overbearing in Hong Kong, mm. and China has let loose for the innovation to happen. Yes, as, as Rajesh mentioned, there is some learning, some pitfalls, but that is actually accelerating the pace mm. of innovation. Mm. The WeChat platform today is so ubiquitous and, and so all-pervading. Mm. There's so many interactions that are happening on WeChat, including payments. And that, even today, Hong Kong does not have that kind of a digital ecosystem. Though Hong Kong, historically, has been yeah. very progressive. 
uh, uh, Rajesh, you know, in the context of uh, the disruption that we're talking about in the retail space, et cetera, as well, what about reimagining supply chain in the context of being able to create much more sustainable enterprises, being able to bring down your carbon footprint and so on and so forth as well? Uh, you know, this is going to be a significant area that we focus on as we talk about the future as well. And technology hopefully will help us reimagine the supply chain also. Absolutely. And even if you basic technology adoption rate in India, and even if I look at places like Kerala, it's phenomenal. It's actually much faster than some of the, some of the Western countries. The, besides the technology adoption rate, the fintech adoption rate, mm. which we see in, uh, in places like Kerala and you know, the rest of India, China, et cetera, this is also going at a very steep pace. Mm. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of reconfiguring of you know, supply chains, and mm. you will see a lot more efficiencies coming up. Mm in some of these value chains. Okay, uh, there's a question that's come in, Rajesh, let me just put that to you. Uh, high edge tech like VR and AI algorithms on the back end of the banking system, how soon do you believe we're going to start to see that happen? I, I think you will see it very soon. Uh, if you want to see it right now, you need to visit the Federal Bank uh, place and you will see the, <laughs> you will actually see the, uh, see the use of VR there. there. There's, been, there's, been a, there's been an agreement I can see here, an off, off stage agreement that has happened here. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I think frankly, uh, you would KPMG see a KPMG loses, EY wins, all right. <laughs> a lot of uh, experience centers of some of these uh, financial institutions already are showcasing some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And if you physically visit some of the offices, you would, um, you know, you would see. So these are all, you know, these are not things of a distant future. Mm. These are all there right now. Okay. So there's two specific questions that have come in for you. Why are banks misusing customer information to push personal loans, credit card, investment schemes? And a separate question that has come in is, how can you make banking more personalized in India? Okay. These are difficult questions to answer. Uh, firstly, I... I think the <clears throat> banks, by design, we are not there to go out and sort of impinge on us, uh, impinge on the customer and uh, make their privacy uh, you know, so less relevant. Uh, for every five instances of people getting agitated, there are 20 instances of people benefiting. Mm. And unfortunately, the five get amplified. And we learn from that and we're trying to sort of get sharper in the way we zero in on the offers and the people we use. And I think the science is, get, is getting smarter at it and the customer uh, is given the chance of uh, trying to opt out. That said, I have to be honest that it's not a perfect 100% uh, uh, strike rate. We do have uh, errors, but it's not because we are indifferent to the uh, customer sensitivities that the design is not to hurt the customer. The design is to both the bank and the institution benefit and the customer gets an offer because uh, you know, for example, at this stage, we uh, we try to do more self-service. That is, we we, we pre-approve an offer to the customer and serve it on his mobile phone. All he clicks and takes it. So there is no... Uh, we're learning from it, right? Mm. We're not trying to invade your privacy, but we're just offering it to you, and you can click and take it. So to that extent, the customer is uh, getting the uh, power to his or her hand to benefit from it without getting privacy invaded. Uh, so there is a certain degree of science that we are applying, mind that mm. we are applying, and we are learning from it. Mm. So the design is not to hurt the customer, not to invade privacy, not to be disrespectful of the yeah. customer's personal requirements. But I think this is a commercial business entity which is sensitive to that. Yeah. We just have to serve it in a manner that the customer, uh, 9 out of 10 or 9.5 out of 10, benefits from it. So you know, that luxury you have to give us so that... We make a mistake, we'll learn and move on. Uh, you know, there's a very interesting question that's come in. I'll, I'll get each one of you, I don't know who wants to answer this, but the question is, if an AI agent were to do something that turns out to be a mistake eventually, who should be liable? And I think the same debate is happening now. We saw this Uber incident involving an autonomous car. And I think as we move towards the future of digital banking uh, uh, in the context of AI, et cetera, this may be an issue that we need to, we need to, I'll to start. think about. Yeah, go I'll ahead, start. guys. Absolutely. OK. I think um, I saw that question very interesting. Whether it's bordering and blurring on the trust aspect also was put in the question, right? So if the AI agent is dialoguing with you, interacting with you, and doing something on behalf of the bank with the customer, and if there is some 
mistake that's done by the AI agent, the responsibility definitely if assume that it is the banker who is talking to you and the banker did the mistake, then the bank is solely responsible. If you gave the wrong data to the AA agent and you did a mistake, you are also equally responsible. Mm. So there is, obviously it is not that the AA agent is independent entity and it is not something absolutely solely coming and talking to you kind of a scenario. Mm. It is part of the bank's technology evolution yes. and some of the processes that have been put through to AI and you're dialoguing or you're interacting with the AI agent. So you need to know in terms of if it is on what based on the data points that mm. you provided and mm. what is the responsibility of the banker. Really, mm. otherwise you would have spoken to a person, right? Instead yeah. of an AI agent. So you're that saying the bank, the bank will continue to be liable? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, Rajesh, go ahead. See, why a bank, right? Today, let's say when you drive a car, there is a lot of technology or software sitting yeah. inside the car yeah. as well. So if you go and crash the car, whose responsibility is it? Your mm. responsibility or the car manufacturer's? Mm. So the same example applies here. It depends on, uh, you know, whether you were responsible for the chaos that happened yeah. or in part the, the system on the other side failed. Yeah, no, so I think there, there are interesting uh, conversations that need to happen. For instance, in the Uber uh, uh, incident that just happened. Now, should you ensure that there is somebody sitting in the driver's seat, even though it's the car that's driving itself and so on and so forth. And I would imagine that most industries that move towards perhaps an AI workforce will need to, will need to grapple with, with some of these uh, challenges. But Geeta, there's uh, more questions that have come your way. Uh, and this one has to do specifically with Kerala's thirst for gold or hunger for gold. <laughs> uh, do, do, you, do you think that this is going to be an investment option that will lose its relevance? Will it become, will gold become irrelevant? in the future and and uh, let me add to that because they're they're talking about whether uh, what can be done to get women in Kerala not to invest so much in gold is a is a demonetization equivalent a good idea no nothing demonetization equivalent is a good idea um, so yes I mean I know this is a Kerala girl having grown up I you know I attended enough weddings where people were talking about gold all the time and wearing what on. Um, so I kind of rebel against that. Um, it, it's in general true, it's not just Kerala, but Indians spend a whole lot on gold jewelry in terms of retail consumption of gold. We are number one in the world. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a general phenomenon. I'm just going to tell you that, you know, uh, 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 as an economist, that in terms of investment, gold is a very risky investment. I mean, so let's just be very clear about that. You know, it's not a safe investment. It's a very volatile well, we've price. We've always heard, heard about safe. gold being the safe haven. So you're saying it's a risky asset to There hold. is no financial economist who will tell you that gold is a safe haven. It is, it's, it's a risky asset. It's true that when you start losing faith in the Reserve Bank of India or anybody, then gold is certainly the best option to have. But it's not the safest uh, at all. And so, I mean, if I were to speak purely as Gita Gopinath, I would say I... I wish we could all get over this obsession for gold, but I can see that. Uh, <laughs> well, may, maybe you will find more takers now. We've got more questions. Uh, uh, Mr. Srinivas, let me uh, put this to you. What is the time frame that you see a bank's virtual branch similar to a virtual experience store by Amazon in the US? What kind of time frame are we talking about? <clears throat> see, I think it's happening even today. Uh, only three days ago, uh, one of the wealth managers sent me the entire file and said, now click a virtual representative will talk to you. And so I think it's already happening. But the question is, will it only be that? And mm. to my mind, and I could be violently wrong, but it's going to coexist for many, many years. I think, and this is India, I'm not talking about the worldwide. We are so layered a society, and uh, I'm not saying economically, just ex ex uh, experience wise and mm. exposure wise. There are so many uh, one percent of uh, a certain percentage of the people are probably very digitally alive and want to be served entirely digitally. And another uh, cohort of people at the another end of the spectrum who want to be served physically. So I don't think it's going to be one size and mm. just this or that. I think they will coexist. In fact, as a mantra, I have chosen this digital at the fore, human at the core. And I genuinely believe they will coexist. And for a long time coming, irrespective of your economic strata, people like to be 
served. I heard Raghuram Rajan speak today. There are certain jobs that you want to be, uh, you, don't, you don't want a robot doing it to you. You just want to be pampered by that capability. And I think banks and advisors of that nature uh, will exist for very, very long. Uh, you know, the mundane stuff will probably get more, uh, the routine stuff will get automated. Mm. But I, I can't, uh, in five, ten years, believe that this will just completely get uh, virtual and no physical experience will be there. So it will coexist. Form, percentage will define. BG, you want to take a stab at that as well? Uh, I, I can agree to what uh, Srinivasan was saying. Yes, all the transactions which typically you had to go to a bank in the past is now happening online. There's no doubt about it. And that experience is getting definitely improvised. Mm. So I think banks are also learning from the retail industry in terms of enhancing the digital experience of online shopping and, and personalization. Mm. And, and I see that happening because I use uh, banking apps to carry out most of my transactions. But the relationship part, I think a lot more effort has to go in. What, what is today happening in the private wealth management, the relationship is much stronger. Yeah. Should translate to retail banking and other forms of any kind of sophistication uh, yeah, in yeah. terms of mortgage or whatever it is. Yeah. And that is an area for focus for the banks for sure. Again, a lot of that can be learned from the other sectors rather than trying to innovate internally. In fact, one of the questions uh, has raised exactly that issue. It says, Mr. Srinivasan, my relationship with my bank manager helps me sleep better at night. In the future, how can we keep the warmth of a relationship as banks go digital? Will I still have a relationship manager? Whoever you are, become a Federal Bank customer. <laughs> right? uh, we will take care of the rest of it. No, I genuinely mean that it's not going to disappear. I think, in fact, in the last one year, 80% of my recruitments were only relationship managers. Uh, we hired about, say, 500 people. 400 were only RMs. Okay. So whoever it is, welcome to become a customer yes, of ours, if you're not already one. Uh, Shireen, I just wanted to make this comment, and this kind of applies not just to our session, but all the other sessions over here, which is we're all talking about digital disruption and the pace at which it's going to go and whether there's going to be this uh, uh, you know, job loss and people mm. are going to have a hard time mm. finding jobs. The truth of the matter is... Look what's happened over the last 10 years. If you look over the last 10 years, everybody will agree that there's been this immense pace of technological growth, huge amounts of disruption in every sector. But if you ask, if you look around advanced economies in most countries in the world, and you ask what's happened to productivity growth, mm. we're all talking about low productivity growth, but we're not talking about job losses in general. The, you know, the unemployment rate in the US is yeah. 4%. Yeah, yeah. So, it's kind of curious that we're all sitting around here saying that, you know, there's all been this immense growth in technology, mm. which then means that that should show up as yeah. higher productivity growth, higher labor productivity, which is yeah. why we think that maybe that should end up yeah. with needing fewer yeah. people. But what we're grappling with now is low the, productivity yeah, growth. I, I, and, you know, I want to I pick up on, on the issue that you talked about, that globally today we're seeing... Un employment or unemployment rates that are at a 40-year low, uh, whether it's countries like the US or whatever, globally that's the trend. But in India, the worry is what is going to happen, and not just because of technology, but whether we're going to be able to create the kind of uh, jobs that we need to. There's a warning that's come in from Paul Krugman, Raghuram Rajan, they said 7.5% growth is not going to be good enough uh, to give you the jobs with 12 million people uh, getting into the workforce. From an India perspective, what is the challenge? No, I, it's, it's, there's no ifs and buts that India needs to create more jobs. Uh, there's no doubt that there is a need for a lot more skilling in India. There's no doubt there's a need for a lot more make in India, uh, in all sectors. So we need to have more investment. We need to have a good uh, investment environment in India. We need to have a good investment environment in Kerala. All of that is important. But what I'm trying to flag over here yeah. is that while we are acknowledging all the technological developments that have happened, we do have time. It's not as if we're in, a, we're in the phase where jobs are becoming uh, yeah. uh, unimportant. And, and so this is the right time to think about the right strategies to put in place, but there's no reason to panic at this point. Okay, there's no reason to panic. Uh, uh, I think there are more questions that have come in essentially around the same issues of banks collaborating more with each other and so on and so forth. So let me then uh, uh, start to get wrap-up comments from each of our panel. And, and Gayatri, since you have the mic, uh, let me start by asking you, what's the one thing that you're most hopeful about and what's the one thing that worries you the most? Security worries me the most. 
And I believe we do have solutions, but uh, we definitely need to implement. And as a country, we need to make sure that the priority is on that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, absolutely of paramount importance. Without that, you know, anything that we say in digital disruption, et cetera, will uh, not be true. Right. And, and the opportunity that young entrepreneurs watching us, uh, whether in this room or online, what is it that you would ask them to focus on? One thing that we need to focus on is definitely in terms of, uh, I would say, customer centricity. Put the customer in the center and look at all the things that you need to do. The innovations that will come is far too many compared to whether you're looking at your startup or it's a bank or it's a retail or it's a anything, right? Put customer centricity is the most, or rather I would call it as in terms of maybe even refine it further, I would call it as customer servicing, right? Look at it from a servicing angle and put the customer in the middle of it. Think from that angle in terms of if you have a customer, what will you expect them to do and the same, right? Okay. That is the most important thing for us to get more innovations. Okay, so be more customer centric, uh, BG. Wrap up comments from you. Hopeful, most concerned about, and message to the entrepreneurs here. Hopeful uh, that there's enough of technologies which are enabling the banking industry and there's more disruption to come and these are all, again, very positive benefits from a customer perspective. In terms of opportunities, again, as, as uh, Gayatri mentioned, today if you just have to put percentages, about 60% of the effort has to be customer-centric, customer experience, customer knowledge, data around customer personalization, and 40% around operations, because there is still a lot in the banking sector to automate and operate. So these are opportunity areas for sure. Concern areas for me is, again, uh, unlike other sectors which have been more rapid in, in embracing, because of the inherent nature of the financial sector itself, there is much more resistance to change. And all the more, the regulator overbearing is, is significantly high in the financial sector, for, maybe for the right reasons. Hence, the pace of change in this sector will, will be slower than other sectors. Okay. Uh, till I get the microphone to Rajesh. Rajesh, go ahead. Uh, most hopeful, most concerned, and your message. Actually, I am very bullish about where technology is going to take humanity in terms of the conveniences, the comforts, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot more coming up ahead than what we have seen. On the other side, though, I'm very concerned about two areas. One is privacy, and one is about security, right? Uh, privacy is, I think, as we start to consume technology, uh, you know, our privacy, our own sense of uh, what we are sharing is getting a little compromised. So privacy and how it is managed is going to become important. Security, of course, is as our digital identities start to go online and it uh, have access to banks and other people, uh, how it is managed and what impact it can have for you. See, the day when we had a bank account and we had a statement, we knew that irrespective of what happened, I could go to the bank and say, here is the statement you gave me and give me the money back. Tomorrow, if it is online somewhere and somebody like they show in some of these Terminator kind of movies, mm. erases everything, then what do we do? So security and uh, privacy are two concern areas uh, legitimately for all of us. Okay, Rajesh? I tend to agree on the security and uh, privacy area. I think uh, when there is more data being generated, we are, we are cautious, we want to ring fence all that data, make sure that it's used in the, you know, uh, it's used in the right formats. Uh, I'm really excited about financial inclusion. Uh, I'm uh, really excited about uh, that we are now looking at more and more structured ways for the unbanked community to also, um, you know, use and um, use and save and you know, manage their earnings and mm. savings a lot better using technology. I'm really optimistic about that. For the young entrepreneur. I don't think your, fin, you know, even if it's fintech uh, solutions, fintech solutions need not necessarily disrupt banking. Please look for ideas which will generate synergies with what the larger banks are doing. And you will find, you know, you will find small problems which you can weave solutions around that. And the, the idea is not to, not to look at disruptive models, but to look at synergistic models for the young entrepreneur. Okay, Geeta. Uh, everybody brought up a bunch of things. Uh, uh, I would just uh, add that I think what I find uh, exciting, which is probably uh, a, a value to young entrepreneurs, is the fact that the kinds of uh, uh, 
you know, the business models that you start do not require the high levels of fixed assets that used to be required way in the past, that you'd have to start with a whole lot of investment in, uh, uh, to get uh, uh, projects going and to become an entrepreneur. Mm. So I think it's much more easier in that sense to become an entrepreneur that day, these days, and I, and I find that uh, to be great. Uh, I am, in terms of what am I more concerned about, I am just more concerned about the general uh, adaptation of our education system to providing the right amount of skills, right kinds of skills for the future, and, and that is what I would worry about more. Okay, so skilling, uh, reskilling, that's an area of opportunity as well as a cause for concern. I'll end with you, Mr. Srinivasan. Yeah, I think the thing that I'm excited by and worried by is probably the same thing. And the reason is, uh, firstly, the entrepreneur part which you asked, many think that their business model is unique and everybody else who's failed has got a, uh, something wrong and they have got that extra uh, sense that will clean the, you know, sort of be the winner. I think some reality has to come on that. I, I, everybody believes that their idea is unique. Of course, I don't want to kill any enthusiasm, but they are, their idea is unique and uh, are almost blind to others' uh, failures. I think there has to be a, a humility to learn and try to make sure that you uh, road test your model better. So that's for the entrepreneurs. Uh, for a bank, certainly everything that we spoke of uh, is, to my mind, uh, an unstoppable force. You have to accept that and, uh, and uh, certainly embrace it and try to be ahead of it. But equally, the same thing that is so exciting is also worrying me, as it may for many others, is I think we have uh, a lots of people in the banks who are yet to come to terms with the fact that everybody appreciates it or learns that something else is happening, but are not rewiring themselves to mm. do it and appreciate it. I think there's a ma massive challenge. I mean, for a bank like ours, uh, our workforce is relatively younger, but their nine to five is different from their five to nine, you know? Mm. So the, we have to figure out how that sort of fuses and actually the day they are at work, they think like they're doing in their outside of work. And mm. that's a massive challenge because by nature, banks want to be conservative and be very regulated. Mm. But a lot of stuff that is happening is actually no, no longer the traditional model of banking. It's now, as um, like all of us spoke, the borders are blurred. There is so much of technology infusion. So how does a, a traditional banker behave the way the new world is uh, needs us to behave and yet keep the basics in place? And that is not easy, but that's what uh, we need to be continuously worried about. So what I'm excited by, I'm also worried by. Well, I, I think that's a great note to end on. I think we've brought you some uh, uh, fairly meaningful insights on what the future could hold and what you need to focus on as you look at that future uh, and the opportunities that that brings with it. My many thanks to BG Srinivas, Gayatri, Rajesh, Mr. Srinivas and Geeta and Rajesh for joining us here this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a good session. Uh, thank you very much for your time this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, the public perception of banking being a fun, cool thing, that's debatable. But then you experts on this panel, you guys were definitely a lot of fun. Do you agree? And to your credit, Shireen, this is the panel which caused the most bouts of laughter in this room. Really, seriously. Thank you. Thank you for that. And on that note, I'd like to invite Mr. Rajesh Nair, who's an HPIC member, to present mementos to the rest of the panelists. First up, to Mr. B.G. Srinivas. I request uh, the presenter and the receiver to please step up to the center stage and uh, do the honors so that we get the moment captured well. Next, Ms. Gayatri Parthasarathi. Ms. Geeta Gopinath. Mr. Shyam Srinivasan. Mr. Rajesh Rege. And finally, our brilliant moderator, Shireen Bhan.
for the first time i get to say this ladies and gentlemen please step up for a picture this is the first time we have had more than one lady on this stage in one panel so ladies and gentlemen please step up